Well, I think this, the signing of today's bill into law represents the hard work of uh, Democrats and Republicans coming. This is a good example of coming together and making progress on something that uh, people had identified as a glaring, uh, a glaring blight on the law. That was former White House press secretary and current MSNBC contributor Robert Gibbs in 2010 on the day President Obama signed the Fair Sentencing Act. The act's purpose was to reduce the sentencing disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. So there's still a disparity, but it's gone from 100 to 18 for crack and powder cocaine offenses. In 2011, the U.S. Sentencing Commission voted to retroactively apply the act. That gave 12,000 prisoners 85 percent of whom were African-American, the chance to have their sentences reviewed and possibly reduced. In spite of that good news, the numbers of those incarcerated for drug offenses remains staggering. Of the 2.3 million people in prison in the United States, 25% of them are there for drug offenses. $70 billion is spent yearly on corrections and incarceration by you, the taxpayers. And while 14 million white Americans and 2.6 million African-Americans report using illegal drugs, 38% of those arrested for drug offenses are African-American. And on average, black Americans spend almost as much time in prison for drug offenses as white criminals do for violent offenses. With numbers like these, we have a long way to go to change the drug sentencing system, which is why I want to come to you, Judge. These disparities feel to me like a central part of the argument for ending this so-called war on drugs. Let me give you an example. In my city, Baltimore, where we have very weak political leadership or non-existent political leadership on this issue, 98% of all of the arrests, investigations, sentences, you name it, are of black people, and more and more are of brown people. Now, this is typical of every major city where there is a substantial black population. And so the war on drugs in Baltimore, Cleveland, New York, Los Angeles, you name it, is a war against black and brown people using and poor drugs. People, you know. And poor white people don't get caught up in the net too much mm -hmm. because there is almost no law enforcement effort at stopping white drug use mm -hmm. anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, there are packets of methamphetamine sure. addiction, but that's the exception that proves the rule. Mm -hmm. And so whites have to be stupid to get arrested for drugs <laughs> in America. Right. But black people are criminalized routinely, and it's a hangover from the alcohol model in the white mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. A-A-N-A. -A -A. Uh, you can get treatment. You can get uh, help. There's a three strikes and out policy on the job. It's all confidential. Mm -hmm. But blacks get criminalized. And so the problem then becomes they become unemployable. They, yep. Their families are destroyed. Their children are no longer ready for education. Age rates go up. And the beat goes on. Yeah, and, and I mean... And in part because of the federal policies that have been part of this, right? So if you have one of these federal offenses, you then can never live in public housing again. You can never get a federal student Not loan again, right? So, right, but I mean, but what, but what we know, I guess, in part, as I'm trying to think through sort of what the Obama administration can do, so they can't intervene necessarily in what's going on in the states, but they could make changes in some of these sort of uh, the X that remains on your back even after uh, the end of imprisonment. That's called the ban the box idea, yep. where you're, there's this box on employment forms you have to tick for the rest of your mm -hmm. life that basically is a death sentence for you to enter yep. the mainstream economy. So yep. what happens to young people is a kid makes a mistake, just like we all do, but there's no margin of error for a young African-American kid right. who's in an inner city and makes that mistake. Now all of a sudden he gets a strike on his record, has to tick that box. He can no longer end up in the mainstream. So he goes to where? The underground economy, which is the only one that will have him. And then we step back and wonder why it goes that way. And we say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, here in New York City, mm -hmm. we have a stop and frisk epidemic, right? Yep. And it's become an national embarrassment, and thankfully it's getting the attention in the courts that it deserves. Stop and Frisk has a program where we stop 700,000 young people, 700,000 people on the streets yeah. every year. 87% of them are young blacks and Latinos. 87%. Yeah. You are nine times as likely to get stopped on the streets of New York just by the cops willy-nilly if you're African American or Latino. Now of that, we frisk half, so about 350,000 mm -hmm. people a year. We only find that in 10% of cases, is there anything actually wrong? Does it lead to an arrest? In 90% of cases, the cop says, oh, you can go now. After you've denigrated this young person in front of their mm -hmm. community, humiliated them in front of their school, their church, their housing project, etc. And then we wonder, 
pull yourself up by your bootstraps while we kneecap you every 45 seconds. Well, and it gives great lie to the idea that this is a war on drugs because, you know, like if you want to find drugs, I encourage all local police departments to go to their local college campus, right? Because there will be students there doing drugs. But we don't think of going to police privileged children in privileged circumstances, right? We just sort of say, as you pointed out, those are young people making mistakes. They're going to get over it. it you know, we don't want to, to, uh, to criminalize them. And yet, if you are making those mistakes in urban communities in a black and brown body, then suddenly it's fine to criminalize you. Exactly. And I think it's important that we be clear on this point, mm -hmm. which is our incarceration rates reflect their artifacts of our enforcement strategies. Mm -hmm. And something that my book traces is how drugs came from something that was policed to drug enforcement being a way to police, mm -hmm. right? There's all kinds of ways in which our government is addicted to the drug war. And I keep calling for an intervention. And one of the most specific kinds of intervention we can make is calling on new ways for our police to um, mm -hmm. conduct themselves, especially in the city. It's also bad for public safety. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think it's about it, if horrible. you preoccupy a police yep. officer with sitting in his patrol car and racking up cheap, easy, petty, nonviolent drug arrests, mm -hmm. well, that's out the driver's side window, and he can rack up many of those a month, and it leads to more overtime, more pay. Mm -hmm. Almost half a police officer's pay can come from that kind of mischief. Well, out the passenger side window, there may be a young person with a mental problem yeah. who's Absolutely. on their way to do something terribly grave in this society, and that threat goes completely unnoticed because there's no profit in it. Right, because we're, we're, we're solely focusing. But the, the other kind of profit... I wanted to, to play, this is actually from your film, The House I Live In, because the other kind of profit is a political profit, this idea that not only are institutions addicted to it, but that politicians are, that they don't want to be the one first person to, to jump out. So I want to listen to this and then ask you your response, Matt. Let's listen. Well, nobody can afford to be the first guy to say, wait a minute, we can't afford what we're doing, let's do something different, because if you even made a noise like you were going to be soft on crime in any way, you would be out of a job. You will be put away and put away for good, three strikes, and you are out. Right, that's the guy who grew the prison industrial sure. complex in this country, in part because of this fear of being soft on crime. Oh, and yeah, at the and same he said time, nobody would ever be harder on crime than him. Yeah. But go um, ahead. But those, yeah. that era of politics is over, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Mm -hmm. the, for Bill Clinton, it was a way to be a Great. new, you know, third-way Democrat. Mm -hmm. I'm not like these old, soft on crime Democrats. I um, am not Jimmy Carter. We don't have that need for differentiation right now. There isn't a big, like, tough on crime th uh, groundswell happening. If anything, it's, it's kind of the opposite, right? If you see 18 states now have medical marijuana regimes, this is hysterically popular in this country. It pulls at 70 to 75 percent, right? We just have Colorado and Washington just legalized recreational pot. We now have a majority of the country believes that marijuana should be legal. And the war on drugs is a war on marijuana. That is the drug that people use, yeah. right? Um, and so you have all of this happening this way, and you don't really have this impetus to be to show your bona fides anymore. So now it's a question of courage. Well, Who has it? Okay, I'm we're going sure. to come to exactly that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in, Judge, because I want to talk about this idea of states as laboratories as soon as we get back.